um, so we're up and running. So I just want to welcome um, the people who have joined us live in the Zoom chat because it's great to have you here to ask your questions. Um, and I just introduce our panels. Um, actually, I might let them introduce themselves as they do their overview. Um, so my name's Kaylee. I'm the Vice President of the Hastings Business Women's Network. And we've also got Kelly King, who is our president. She's um, part of our Zoom meeting this morning. Um, and we've got three members of our panel. So we've got Leslie Williams, Cara Dale and Sandra McGann. And I'm going to go to each of you ladies individually to introduce yourself and to give an update from your perspective so that we can get started this morning. And so, Leslie, I'd love to start with you, if that's OK. Well, thank you, Kaylee, and uh, welcome to everybody, the participants, and uh, those that are going to listen in later on. Um, but obviously, I'm the state member for Port Macquarie, and it's just been a really great, I think, initiative to be able to participate in these sessions and provide information to the community. And, and a shout out to to Cara and Sandra, who are also providing some really good information about some of the initiatives. So I thought I might just do just a very quick update about statistics. Um, because, as we acknowledge, at the end of the day, this is really about a health issue and making sure that we can keep our community safe. And then going on from that, it's about how we can make sure our economy stays um, as intact as is possible in these uh, really unusual circumstances. Um, so currently in New South Wales, there are almost 3,000 COVID positive cases. But of course, remembering that many of those have actually already recovered. Um, sadly, uh, overnight, another death means that the death toll has risen to 30. Um, and currently, there are 249 people who are being treated in our hospitals, with 22 of those in ICU. I guess what's more um, uh, relevant to us locally is that in our local health district, um, we are up to now 49, sorry, 48 cases, um, and 34 of those are now showing signs of recovery. So that's all very positive and we are seeing some positive trends. Um, in Port Macquarie, uh, 26 positive cases and 20 of those have recovered. Just, but bearing in mind that 24 of those are either related to overseas travel or cruise ships. Um, and so um, we, are, we are quite pleased with the trend, but I just guess like the other leaders, uh, you know, I just want to reiterate the importance of staying on track and making sure that we comply with the public health order, which still remains in place. Um, all of those things that you're hearing about, only two people out at a time, social distancing, um, only leaving home if you absolutely have to work from home, uh, which of course many of us do. I know that um, the other two participants are going to talk, talk specifically about job keepers, which obviously is a federal initiative, so I'm not going to go into that. But um, I just wanted to um, just highlight the trading license waiver. Now, if it's not for you, maybe it's for some of your partners, make sure you pass it on. Uh, but basically what we're doing is waiving license fees for 12 months to up to 200,000 tradies across the state. Now, I know very well talking to the tradies that have been in my place in the past that uh, their license fees are quite significant. Um, so when they go to renew them, uh, they just actually won't they'll be renewed, but without any cost actually to them. And all of that is on the Service New South Wales website, which is pretty easy to follow. Um, of course, it was an announcement this morning, and unfortunately, we don't have a huge amount of detail, but that relates to the bushfire industry recovery package of $140 million, which is specifically for the horticulture, agriculture uh, industry. And uh, so we'll look forward to providing, and I know Carl will be keeping updated on but that, those details when they actually come to light. Um, the other important thing is that we change some regulations where the government change regulations so that councils now have the ability to defer your council rate charges. Obviously, they're about, um, they're about to come uh, out to you if you haven't already got them. Uh, and so whilst the New South Wales government doesn't change them, there was a regulation which meant that councils couldn't. So we've just taken that away. So now councils can make decisions about where they uh, take up that opportunity to waive the council rate uh, across the board and defer payment for another month. Um, so obviously I've already talked to the mayor and the general manager about that. They're aware of that ability now. So hopefully they'd like to be able to pass that on. Because again, I think that Whilst there only might be small amounts, anything that we can do to support um, families and businesses during this period is all going to add up. It's all going to help make sure that they stay viable 
and uh, are able to manage uh, through this difficult process. I'm going to leave it there. I'm sure there's going to be some questions. I am going to say a little bit at the end uh, about Anzac Day, which is on Saturday, and hopefully we're all going to remember that. And uh, I'll just let you know about an initiative that you might want to be participating in. Thanks, Kayleen. No problem. Thank you so much, Leslie. And yeah, I really appreciate if you could do that um, update at the end regarding Anzac Day because that's that's super important for all of us. Um, we might go to you, Cara, and if you could just give a bit of an overview of what you've been working on recently, and in particularly as Leslie touched on um, the announcement that we heard this morning. Yeah. Um, so my name is Cara Dale, and I run a consultancy business called C2 Hills Consultancy. And our business is about sharing knowledge of opportunities of how businesses can connect to government effectively and also where those opportunities lie in the processes. So we've been helping a lot of businesses apply for the Service New South Wales either $10,000 bushfire grant or the COVID-19. And people need to understand at the moment it is self-regulated. However, um, there is a audit trail happening just like JobKeepers, there's a significant audit trail that will happen. And we are doing a lot of special consideration. So if your business does ABN is not greater than two years old, you really can't tick the box to say that you've got comparable data. So what we've done is put cases up for clients so that when they tick that declaration box, they've already got pre-approval and that we've already had a conversation with Service New South Wales. And both um, the all government, both state and federally really are about saying don't self-exclude. If you are outside the box, put your hand up, have a conversation with the department and the assessment team, and they will work through a solution for you. And it's all it might take an extra couple of weeks to get that ten thousand dollars, but at least you've gone through the process that you have no risk of an audit um, and you haven't ticked to sign a declaration when it's not one hundred percent correct or. So it's really important. We've been helping a lot of clients around bushfire funding and understanding what their recovery plans look like. So how will a business recover? Because in a four month period here, we've basically gone from significant bushfires into COVID-19 and that has an economic impact on our businesses. Generally from the disaster on with the um, COVID-19, uh, with the bushfires, it really takes about 90 days to really see that impact in your cash flow. Um, some other businesses, like a hospitality will see it instantly. So we're working with businesses about how do they recover and how do they effectively connect with government for both opportunities under COVID-19 and bushfires. And we're also, there's so much information coming out that we're notifying clients that are relevant. So, you know, for example, on Friday, all the awards got updated to reflect job keepers and Sandra will start talking about that. But there's all this additional information that's coming out and um, our priority is to help clients get through it as quickly as possible and, um, and raising, putting our hand up if they're slightly outside the square. Excellent. Thank you so much, Cara. And I'm sure there'll be questions for you um, this morning as well. Um, we might go to you, Sandra, if you could give an overview of what you and your team at Sea Change have been doing to, um, to help people navigate all the, um, the challenges and all the complexities that Cara touched on then. So... Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I think today's um, a good day to, for, for me to be taking part in this um, because it's the first day that we can actually, businesses can enrol for the JobKeeper program. So it's uh, very timely um, and a good opportunity just to go over what we've been working on. So the last three weeks, JobKeeper's been keeping us very busy. Um, as Karen mentioned, there's been um, a lot of information coming out over the last three weeks um, from the announcement of the program. And I thought I might just give you a bit of an overview of what that, what the program um, and the scheme is, is about, um, and then talk about what we've, we've been doing to, um, to help our clients um, understand um, what it's about. So it, the JobKeeper is a wage subsidy scheme that was announced by the federal government on the 30th of March. And it's gonna run for six months. Um, and it's a subsidy of $1,500 of flat payment per employee for, per fortnight, um, which covers full-time, part-time and casual employees where they've been employed over 12 months. Um, businesses must show a significant drop in turnover um, and there's tests to establish mm -hmm. that. Um, and the program or the schemes administered um, through the ATO online services um, and um, particularly single touch payroll. Um, so yeah, um, 
there's been a lot of information coming out over the last three weeks. Um, fact sheets initially from tre um, Treasury, then when the legislation came out just prior to Easter, um, just for us to get our head around the rules, um, the eligibility for businesses, um, eligibility for the employees. Um, we've you know, spent a lot of time advising clients, being on the phone, emails out to them, um, just covering whether they're eligible, what they need to do, getting their systems in place, the records they need to keep and all the requirements. Um, been putting together some um, fact sheets and information on our website and just trying to keep that updated so that businesses can um, find out more. Um, so there's fact sheets on whether they're eligible, how to, how to look at the turnover tests, how they work, um, who, the, who it applies to. Um, so it's not only employees, it's also sole traders and people operating through trusts and companies and partnerships. Yeah, there's a lot to navigate. And I know that um, there's a lot of information that's accessible for our members and for our community. Um, but I think that, as you would say as well, Sandra, like there's a source of truth there in the ATO websites and the Fair Work websites. And sometimes um, the interpretation of those pieces of information can get a bit muddied. So it's great that people can go to someone like yourself and someone like Cara. And I know I've been speaking to a lot of people as well about applying those those new rules and um, schemes to what's relevant for them. Okay, so we're going to go to um, Glenda and Sharon and Nicole and just see what questions you've got for us or for, um, for our panel that are relevant for you that you would like us to address. You can either um, just raise your hand. I don't think any of you are muted anyway. <laughs> Um, or, or you can put it in the chat box, whatever works yeah. well for you. We might start with you, Glenda. You, you look like you've got a question. I have. Um, I'm a sole trader um, and my, my business is going into the homes of kids with autism, Asperger's, other disabilities, and obviously I can't do that now. Um, my, number one, because I'm 66 and I have certain health issues and they say stay home, which I do except to go around the corner to Woolies. Um, I've had a few kids the last couple of weeks. I've taught myself to do Zoom and I've had a couple of kids that I can do that with. Now, my problem is that I get paid sometimes two weeks after I do, because I do NDIS and fax kids. So I get paid weeks after sometimes a month later. When I looked at the criteria for the job keepers, um, my income has totally dropped, but I get paid for say two months ago, I got paid this week. So I'm just not sure whether my statements and whatever, I've, I haven't looked at what you've got to put in yet, but I'm not sure mm -hmm. whether I'm actually going to be able to do that if like November, was up. Um, March obviously was down and April's down, but I'm still getting, like with facts, I can get paid at term in advance that might come six weeks later. So does that still fit in with the criteria? Yeah. Do I, can I just say, hey, I've dropped, I've got three kids now instead of 12, yeah. but the money's still coming in? Yeah, it's based on cash flow, but I'm gonna get Sandra to answer that because I am definitely not an accountant. <laughs> Okay, so the ATO have actually clarified now when um, estimating or projecting your turnover, you can use a cash basis or you can use what they call an accruals base, which is really what the work that you're doing and, and what you're invoicing at that time. So even if, if, if you decide that, the, um, that you want to go with that method, the fact that you're receiving cash in from previous work won't won't impact your, your turnover assessment. So that you could actually look at what you're invoicing at the moment or for the month of April. So you can actually use, um, you can choose whether you use the month of March and compare that to a comparable period for the prior year, or whether um, you have a look at what you project April will be in terms of your invoicing and the work that you've done and compare that to the same period last year. Um, 
Oh, so it's got to be compared to the same, like if I did April, it's got to be April last year. Yes. yes. Oh, see, that's going to be tricky because I only started the business in February last year okay. or January. So there are some alternate tests that are coming out, but they actually yep. haven't um, clarified what they're going to look like, but they know that there are going to be situations where businesses haven't been running for 12 months. Um, so there are some tests coming out, but we just haven't got any, any clarity as to, okay. to what that's going to look like at this point in time. Um, so should I still apply? The applications for April will close on the 30th of, of um, April. Yeah. Um, but I would imagine that those alternate tests will be out before that period. Okay. So it's just a matter of keeping an eye on it. And um, Great. Thanks okay. so much, Sandra. That was, that was really clear. I might just go to Cara and see if you've got anything to add to that response, Cara. Um, so, Glenda, you're a prime example of some of the work that we've been doing with um, COVID-19 and bushfire $10,000 working capital. So, yeah. because you haven't had your ABN done for 24 months, um, what you may be able to be eligible for those grants, but the process we need to do is have a conversation with Service New South Wales. When basically how Service New South Wales is treating it at the moment, is they're asking the question, before you started your business, you would have made an informed decision about how, why you were going into business. You may have done a detailed business plan, you may have done a cash flow, you may have done some research. Yep. Whatever that might be, and it can be as elaborate, it doesn't, or however it's, however it just, you justify to yourself that it was the right decision to enter into business, we would provide that as a supporting document to any of those grants. So. That can be for any type of business. And just remember that both bushfires and COVID-19, um, there is, it's, it's, it's industry-wide. So there's no exclusions. Mm -hmm. And it's about the story of your individual business. Okay. <laughs> helpful for you, Glenda? Um, I'll have to think on it all and look at all the, <laughs> all the stuff. It's, I knew it wouldn't be straightforward. Yeah, but the main, the main thing is to not, um, I hear Cara say this a lot, don't self-exclude. So, you know, yeah. keep looking for what there is available to help you. Yeah. So just on the grant, don't you have to earn a certain amount to apply yeah. for the grant? Okay, so it, um, the bushfires is a 40% downturn in sales, um, period on period. So it, you can choose any 90-day period from the 1st of September 19 until the 31st of March. And then it's that same period for the previous year. So you may be able to qualify there um, if you started in April of last year. And then in relation to COVID-19, it's a 30% decline. So again, it's a 14-day it's a comparable period um, while um, the bushfires is a 90-day comparable period. But if you want specific information of how you do your assessment, you're mm -hmm. always welcome to call me offline. Thank you. Um, and thanks for asking that question, Glenda, because we often find that the questions that we hear in these groups are questions that other people have as well. So it's been useful for us to be able to frame it around your question, but I'm sure it'll be useful for others when they when they view this recording. So thank you for that. Um, any questions from you, Sharon or Nicole? At this stage, no. <clears throat> no? Okay, so um, what about you, Kelly? I've left you in the middle there, you... <laughs> Yeah, so I have a question in relation to um, JobKeeper, and I'm not really sure. It's it, it's technically not about the legislation, um, more about um, the employees themselves. Um, and obviously, um, given that we've, and I've shared this in previous um, webinars that we've done, um, across our nine venues, we've only got two or three operating on very low turnover, yet we have a lot of employees now sitting there um, not working um, and are very keen to get their hands on the job keeper payments. Um, but we also have a number of employees who are working um, in the few, in the handful of venues that are still operating. So we have a situation where, um, and we also have a situation where we have employees that are refusing to come back and reopen venues that, um, because they'd rather sit at home on job keeper. So I guess from an employer perspective, what protections do we have from employees who are looking to abuse the system and rather sit at home and get the payment than turn up for work? Um, 
That sounds and, good. And, like and do the job. <laughs> <laughs> um, but rather than me kind of talk to that, what I might do is go to Cara because I know Cara and I have spoken quite a lot about the Fair Work site and the vari- the award variations and the provisions that Fair Work have. I will always say that's the source of truth there. But I might get Cara to give an overview that would be useful, not just for your question, Kelly, but for a lot of other people who have similar questions. Yeah, so um, it's a very good question and it, it's meant to be a mutual two-way benefit. So um, the employer allows eligible business um, employees to go on there on the basis that when you're given the green light to, re, to re-establish yourself, you've got all that knowledge of your businesses and you're ready to go. However, there is some scope there that um, as an employer, you, if you're there has to be um, a mutual agreement. So if you had an employee under, and Fair Work um, website is the website I would go to. It It's constantly updated. It, it, all the awards got updated on Friday the 17th. So that sort of provides some protection for employers. So under, um, and it's effective until the 28th of September this year. So, the, so basically in your instance, Kelly, if you've got people that are refusing to come into work, if you've got, workable hours that they can come in, even if it's one day a week to do um, preparation about, you know, yep. your business and it's outside their, new, their normal realm, you can actually say, well, as part of the of putting them on JobKeepers, your job description is going to change now until we're allowed to reopen. So it could be that the waiter is going to be in there helping in the kitchen, cleaning things, or it might be doing preparation around how your business will re-establish. You might be doing some renovations or minor alterations. So the employer explains that, you know, if there is an opportunity to do work to help your business re-establish itself, then it has to be a mutual agreement. But there can't be the expectation that um, they may have a 30-hour contract and they may only come in one day a week for seven hours. But there needs to be, um, the employer has, has to demonstrate what those hours are and negotiate with that, employee that they've got the skills that are required to do that and then go through the process of what fair work there's a stepped process that you need to go through including relevant letters and there are templates available to help you make sure that you manage your obligations but it's disappointing when you do hear some employees won't come in even for (laughs) one day a week to help you out when you when at the end of the day job keepers it's not compulsory for employers to take people on it's trying to balance and ensure that those employees have a job when you recover. So, yeah, it is um, quite disappointing. But you may be also covered by um, the Restaurant Award and the Hospitality Award, Kelly, in your particular instance, and there's further um, amendments that have been made to help protect and help negotiate those steps you need to take. Okay, great. Thank you. And you're right, um, Cara, and the clue's in the title. It's about keeping jobs. It's not a job, it's not a job stay at home program. It's a job keeper program. But it is one of the things I feel like I talk about all day. It is the employer's role to make it a safe workplace because I'm sure you're also referring to some people saying, no, I'm staying at home because it's the safest place to, for me to be. So there's a lot, it, it gets quite complicated and you've got the added complication where people are saying that I feel that I need to stay at home for my own health or for the health of my family or my children. So sometimes it is just a a, quite a um, case by case approach, as Cara said. And one other thing also too with what the state government has done and the federal government is they've changed your normal hours of operation. So if you have an employee that says, I can't come in because I've got a pre-existing health condition, well, you can have them come in on a Saturday or a Sunday potentially when no one else is there to do the work that you want. Okay. That doesn't mean they get double time or time and a half because the variation has changed. So if someone says, well, look, I have an underlying health condition and I shouldn't be, um, yes, I can perform the duty, but I don't want to be with any contact, there are um, some, there have been changes in relation to the hours of operation and that may be a way of negotiating a mutually agreed option um, and the place of work as well. So for some people, there might be some tasks and projects or professional development that they can actually do f- remotely as well. So, yep. okay. So I'm just mindful of time. And um, for all the people who watch our, um, um, our Zoom meetings, um, 
later, then um, it's, it's a lot for them to watch. But I'm just going to go to Sharon and Nicole because I can see a raised hand. So <laughs> a question down there? Sorry, just um, uh, one quick question. It, 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 basically, the question is to Sandra. I'm just interested because we had a situation where, um, as you know, the employee can only get one JobKeeper payment from one employer. Um, this particular employer has a full-time job as well as a part-time job, as in a casual job. Um, who he held for longer than 12 months. And he um, decided upon himself to take the job keeper or, or is going to take the job keeper from the casual job because that will in effect top up his payment to $1,500 per fortnight. Um, however, the employer, the full-time employer is like, well, no, we want you to take it through us so that they can get the benefit of the subsidy. Um, so that they're only required to pay the difference in the $1,500. So, um, you know, have you had any situation where that has popped up? Where, you know, is the employee or the employer, like, can the employee choose who? who... I believe they can. They're the, in the nomination form that's out on the ATO website. Um, as I understand it, the employee has to give um, their permission to, to be included in the JobKeeper program oh, for that yeah. particular employer. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, that, that, I mean, that's what I thought, but it's just, I guess that's another example where, um, you know, the employer that is paying mm. the big money to keep them on um, and paying them their full time and topping up the payment, but still have suffered a downturn in their, in their revenue is um, yeah. a difficult yeah. one to decide on, I guess. It is, it is. And as I understand it, there's nothing to prevent them um, earning income um, from another from another job, so. And it will be monitored by the ATO. So it's not, you know, you probably get those sorts of questions as well is like, how do I know that my employees aren't doing this, this and this? And it's like, well, the, the ATO will be monitoring that. It's, um, but there's a there's a lot of communication out there about what is meant by your main job and, and so on, where you, is it is it based on where you have declared your tax-free threshold. So there's a lot There's a lot of information that people are mixing up. So it's a great question to have asked Sandra because some things just haven't been clarified and it is then coming down to communication and talking to your employees and, and trying to have reasonable, meaningful conversations with what's, with what's reasonable. Um, great. So I might just, in wrapping up, I'll just check with Glenda and Sharon and Nicole and Kelly and see if you've got any last questions for our panel before I get them to do a, a final summary. No. I had one other question. Yes, right. <laughs> um, and, and possibly for Leslie. Um, and, and I know that you're state government, um, but again, um, as a, as a, I guess a medium sized business were excluded from a lot of the um, government grants that have come out for both bushfire and COVID-19. Um, will there be um, any grants or financial injections for businesses that don't qualify? So the bigger businesses um, or um, I mean, from what our experience and also from what I'm hearing from other businesses, um, the government guaranteed bank loans are not being handed out. Um, they're, they're not forthcoming. Um, so are there any sort of other business recoveries that really give a, a, a direct boost to cash flow for bigger businesses that are potentially in the pipeline? <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. So um, I'm gonna, are you excluding, I mean, you know, obviously not about the $10,000. Um, yeah, so we're, exclu so. We're, ex we're excluded from that. I know there's a bushfire recovery um, loans um, process. Will there be something similar for COVID-19 COVID coming through? Uh, look, I guess, um, I, look, I don't have the specifics in front of me of all the grants, but needless to say, if there is nothing at the moment, um, again, I encourage you to email me and I can put, certainly pass on to Pat Conaghan, the federal member, where there are gaps uh, where people feel as though they're not eligible for anything uh, during this period. Obviously, uh, JobKeeper is fairly wide ranging and um, it's going to hopefully cover a lot of employees in terms of their employees. Um, but, uh, and, and also to add that, um, you know, they'll continue to be, I mean, as you saw today, another $140 million announced yep. by the state government. So there isn't an end to this process. We'll continue to try and fill gaps wherever we can. And I personally have handed to the Premier a couple of examples where I think that uh, we could do some more work. And I know that her and her team are looking at them. 
but we do need to have that information from people to be able to pass it on, uh, you know, particularly people uh, and businesses that are on the ground. So feel free to send me through an example of something that you're looking at. Uh, the other thing I always encourage people to do, Service New South Wales does have a business concierge uh, area where you can actually uh, ask for an appointment uh, and so you can specifically talk one-to-one -one with someone about what might be available for you. Okay. Um, and so I would encourage you to do that. And you don't you don't have to sit on the line, and I could also sit on the line, it's there 24-7. Uh, but if you want to book an appointment, you can do that through that process. And again, just to everybody, I encourage you to download the Service New South Wales app because that will provide you with updates as well. Um, and obviously work through people who are very knowledgeable like Sandra and Cara um, who can keep up to date. I mean, I guess the challenge for everybody is that every business is different. As you all know, Kelly, we're all, yep. we're all set up differently. You know, the way I set up my previous business was different than another sole trader or partner may have. Um, so it's about being able to talk through on a case-by-case -case basis what it is that you actually need, what are you looking for, whether any of these grants are actually trying to apply to you. I just would expect that there would be a number of businesses in our uh, situation who are that medium size, who are finding themselves just caught in the middle. Um, you know, yeah. uh, we're seeing the federal government underwriting um, massive amounts of money for big corporations, um, and there's grants coming out for small businesses, but these businesses in the middle um, at the moment under COVID-19 are, are not sort of really um, eligible for a lot apart from JobKeeper. Um, and, you know, we have, to cash, we have to cash flow JobKeeper as well, so <laughs> yeah, um, because it's in arrears. Yeah, but if you want to send me uh, send me kind of just what your kind of business looks like, you don't have to put your name or anything to it. Um, I sure. can then put it forward to ask what other um, what other you know incentives uh, may suit you. Great, thank you. <laughs> Thanks no so much, Leslie. I'll just check in with Cara and see if you've got anything else that you could um, share that might help Kelly. So just at the moment, as um, Kelly just um, covered off on, there is the concessional business loans and um, they're ma managed by the Rural Assistance Authority and they do have an FTE classification of permanent staff of 20 or under. Now, there you can put a case forward in relation to if you're above that and under the calculations, um, they don't include casuals. So... It's always worth having a conversation um, to work out how we can go about uh, what does that wording mean? How is that interpreted? How do I link that back to my business? Am I just inside or just outside? And then there's a process that we can get to then get that, um, that certainty. But Kelly is, you know, right in relation to that meet, you know, those businesses that do have that sort of 50 and above employees, there, there isn't, those concessional loans available. And I guess there is more work at a federal government level at the moment about how do we assist those those businesses that can employ those people but do need a little bit of a helping hand to get through the COVID-19. Great. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Leslie and Cara, for answering that question. It's a great question, Kelly, because I'm sure it does um, relate to a lot of our members and people within our community. Um, so another... I'll just go to Sandra and just see if you've got any last words. Otherwise, I'll just wrap up for this morning. Um, just quickly, um, obviously, today's the first day that you can enrol. So I just wanted to clarify that there is a difference between the registering the expression of interest that has been available um, on the ATL website um, for a few weeks now, I think. Um, so today's the first day where you actually can enrol. Um, so you can either do this yourself and you'll need a, a MyGov ID um, and have linked your businesses through the Relationship Authorisation Manager, um, which will then give you in access to the ATO online services and the business portal, or you can have your own account a tax advisor um, do this on your behalf. Um, and there's just a very small window of opportunity to actually enrol for the April um, reimbursement of the wage subsidies. So the um, enrolments start today the 20th and they need to be completed by the 30th. So there's a 10 day window there. Um, okay, great. That's, that's very important. So a lot of um, really key points that have come out from this morning. So um, as Sandra just said, it's important to enrol. I know we've been 
um, really highlighting the importance of registering and now we're saying that you now need to go the next step and enrol. Um, and I think also just some really useful resources for people to be able to access. So remembering that you've got your ATO website that is your source of truth as well as the Fair Work Commission. Um, and Leslie also shared the importance of accessing the Service New South Wales site and the app, um, both for the tradies as well as for the concierge service. Um, and just a reminder from Cara around the, um, the bushfire relief funding that's now available. So lots of takeaways, um, but I do really appreciate um, the great questions as well, because not only are we able to highlight the updates and the important resources that are able to be accessed, but we can also relate it to some, some real um, questions that are coming out from, from you, Glenda, um, Sharon and Nicole, as well as Kelly. So I um, really appreciate that. And I'm sure those people who are going to be watching this recording in their own time will really appreciate that you asked those questions and kept the conversation really relevant for everyone. So I will let you all go, but thank you again. It's great to keep these conversations flowing on a regular basis because it is um, we're out, we are in circumstances that seem to change on a, a daily and weekly basis. Um, so it's really, really great to be able to continually access um, Leslie, Cara and now Sandra's time. So a big thank you to all of you for being on our panel. And thank you for those who participated in the Zoom room and for those who are listening in their own time. Hopefully you found it useful. You can definitely send us messages um, if you're not able to attend on the day um, with questions that we can answer as we continue to run these sessions, both for our members and for our local community. So um, I've just got a um, one last thing that Leslie um, offered to share with everyone before we finish, and that is about the very important day that's coming up on Saturday. So I'll just go to you, Leslie, to talk about Anzac Day and, and what's happening in our community so that we can honour that day. Oh, thanks so much, Kaylee. And it is really important that we do on our Anzac Day and what is really going to be exceptional circumstances for our RSL members. And uh, I've spoken to Greg, Greg Laird this morning, obviously, our sub-brunch president. And uh, whilst they're extremely upset that it's not going to go ahead as usual, he just wants me to pass on a couple of things. And I will reiterate them on my website and my column that I normally do in the local paper. Uh, firstly, that... People can go and lay a wreath pretty well any time during the day if they choose to do so, but obviously be mindful um, that, you know, you have to have social distancing. Only two people can be there at a time. But that left that open so people have that opportunity if they want to go and do that. Uh, but secondly, uh, there is a bit of a campaign happening called Light Up the Dawn where what this is aimed to people is to go out into your driveway or on your balcony um, at 6 o'clock and you can uh, either listen to the podcast or... Um, you know, just take that time uh, at the dawn to remember those uh, who have fallen and, you know, make so many sacrifices for our country. So I really urge people to do that, share it with your neighbours and, um, you know, it might be a good way just to even be able to connect from a distance with your neighbours, give them a wave uh, and acknowledge um, that you are there to uh, remember our fallen. Thank you. That's fantastic, Leslie. And a really wonderful note to finish this morning on. So thank you for um, sharing that information. And thanks again for everyone for attending or viewing um, today's podcast. So I'm just going to stop the recording now. Um,